Hello, everyone, and welcome to another day of the second wave of the pandemic, Science and Society. Our guest today is Dr. Colin Ennis. He is a licensed clinical psychologist working with adults and adolescents. He's committed to social justice, so Dr. Ennis has presented nationally on the intersections of race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation. He is going to answer your questions about health during COVID-19 and also guide us through some useful practices that we can try to apply during these times. Um, per his suggestion, uh, which we posted in Canvas over the weekend, I am wearing comfortable clothes. I'm in a hopefully quiet place until Anvil Head starts to bark. Um, and that's right. Uh, and I am, I, I have a pen and paper to write with. Um, I am really looking forward to this and I just want to encourage you all. I know that I've said this before, but really to get the most out of this class, it's great if you don't try and multitask, you focus on the task at hand. And I would say for this class session in particular, it will be really great if you focus on the task at hand and don't try and multitask. Um, and hopefully we will all walk away with some, some great tips for how we can manage our mental health during the pandemic. So um, looking forward to a great session. Welcome, Dr. Ennis. Hey, thanks. Uh, thank you for having me. So a little bit about why I'm here. Uh, I'm here because the pandemic is stressful and mental health is suffering. Uh, I'd offer you data but I know that I don't need to because from reading your questions, it's clear that you all are experiencing a lot of stress and know people that are experiencing a lot of stress. And so the suffering is for many good reasons. First and foremost, there's so much anxiety in the pandemic. The virus is scary and it's worse than when we thought, it's worse than what we thought it was a year ago. Uh, we don't know when we're safe and when we're not safe. It's not localized and discrete, so we don't know when it's over and we don't know who has it or who doesn't have it. Uh, humans also really need a sense of control and we just don't have it right now. In addition, there's trauma for people that have had COVID. So that's another source of anxiety. Second, we have to manage all this anxiety in isolation, which humans are not designed to do. We have a fundamental need to not just connect with others, but to find uh, new things. That's the, <clears throat> that's the oldest need. If you go all the way down our, to the bottom of our brainstem, the thing that is the most us is we have to find new things, find new people. And then somewhere like a couple hundred million years ago, we, have, we developed this need to love and take care of one another. And we're not allowed to do those things the way that we're used to doing them. And then of course, there's also all the grief in this. First and foremost, for all the people that have lost, we've kept 500,000 people. And if we were just to randomly say that they were really, really important to a dozen people in this world, of course, for some people it'd be a lot more and some people would be fewer. That's 6 million people in acute grief. And also not being able to grieve them in the way that they normally would, which is really hard. And then there's also a lot of grief for what is lost. I know for me, one of my favorite things in the world is theater. And who only, whoever knows when we're going to get 4,000 people sitting in a, in a theater ever again. That is a long way off for us. Uh, not for people in Australia who are doing it right now because they have a different uh, sort of approach than we did. But for us, it's a long way off. And then finally, there's the fatigue in all this. Uh, it's been a year of shutdown. This is inhumane, right? Um, and so we have this hope of the vaccine. And the vaccine is amazing and I, I can't help but emphasize, I can't under, over, I can't overemphasize what a miracle you're witnessing with this vaccine coming so quickly and being so effective. But what I've noticed is that for a lot of people, hope turned right away into impatience. They want this thing in their arm, they want it now. Um, and the rollout in the, in the beginning, at least right now, has felt a, not unlike the Hunger Games. Uh, when your number gets called, you got to keep your ear to the ground and see where you can get it, if you can get it. And the rollout's been really unfair. Uh, for instance, I'm a mental health practitioner, so I'm in healthcare, so I get it before teachers and grocery store workers. That's not fair. Uh, which, so that's been very frustrating. Somebody used a great metaphor, which is the vaccine is like the light at the end of the tunnel. 
but we don't know how much tunnel there is between us and the light. And that's really frustrating. And we have more work to do still, more precautions we still have to take. So I wanna help you today with some psychological first aid to help you survive this pandemic. So my goals for today are uh, to walk you through three different relaxation protocols so you can decide for yourself which works best for you. We're gonna start with guided imagery. At one point, we're gonna talk about breathing relaxation, and then we're gonna end with something called progressive muscle relaxation. Between those, I'll also teach you some ways to manage your anxiety, teach you how to protect your mental health, teach you how to help others. Um, so as Chris said, I hope as many of you as possible are in comfortable clothing and are somewhere quiet and ideally alone. Um, and if not, you'll at least have this video to come back to later. So we're gonna start with the guided imagery. So first I'm going to disable my camera now so that there's nothing for you to look at and so that you can just close your eyes and concentrate. We're gonna start with the candle visualization. To begin the candle visualization relaxation, find a comfortable position Take note of how your body feels. Take a deep breath in. And as you exhale, notice where your body feels tense. Focus on these areas as you take another breath. Allow the tension to flow away as you breathe out. Inhale and raise your shoulders. Then relax as you exhale and allow your shoulders to relax into a comfortable position. Continue to breathe smoothly and gently as we start the candle visualization relaxation. As you rest peacefully, begin to form an image in your mind. Imagine that you are in a safe, comfortable room. The room is pleasantly dark. Imagine the glow of a candle beside you. Keep your attention facing forward as you notice the gentle flickers of warm light on the wall in front of you. See the dancing light from the candle. Feel yourself relaxing as you watch the beautiful patterns made by the light of the candle. You might want to turn and look at the candle. If you wish, turn in your imagination toward the candle. Now picture the candle in front of you and see the soft light it creates. Notice the flame gently moving as the candle burns. Imagine what the candle looks like. What shape is it? What color? What size? Create a picture of the candle in your mind. Imagine that the candle gently melts away the stresses and tensions you have been holding in your body. As the candle burns, feel the tension easing and relaxation flowing through your body. Notice the wax becoming softer. Feel your body also becoming softer. Notice again the soft flame at the top of the candle. See how it flickers slightly in response to your breath as you exhale. Watch how the flame responds each time you breathe out. Now, Turn your attention back to the wax of the candle. The softening wax is melting, turning into liquid, warm and flowing, free from tension. See the wax of the candle melting, melting the way your tension is melting away. As the melted wax builds, 
See it slowly drip down the side of the candle, drop by drop. It feels like any stresses you were holding on to are dripping away with each drop of wax from the candle. The soft flame of relaxation warms you from the inside, melting away all stress. Watch the wax melting, feeling the same effects on the tension in your body. Melting, dripping, relaxing. Continue to observe the burning candle for a minute, enjoying the relaxation you are experiencing. When you are ready to finish your relaxation session, take a deep breath in and exhale through your mouth, blowing out the candle. Slowly bring your awareness back to the present. Become more aware of the time and place you are in right now. Slowly stretch out your muscles if you need to and open your eyes enjoying the feeling of calm and peace that remains with you. All right, that's the end of the candle visualization. Um, in the Q&A, um, can you tell me a little bit of how that was for you, what, your, what that experience was like for you, students? Okay, someone felt very relaxed, good. That's what we're going for. Okay, good, good, good. And that's what, this is what I was hoping to hear. Calm, calm, let's talk. okay. Dr. Ennis, can you share what people are saying because they can't see each oh, other? Oh, most people are saying it was calming and relaxing, felt less tense. One, oh, someone said it's great not to be distracted by phones for two minutes. I highly recommend we have more of that in our life. Somebody made a really good point that it was hard to stay focused on the candle the whole time. So that is why we're going to, um, Oh, someone mentioned it was hard at first, but it got easier as time went on. Um, sometimes hard to concentrate. Um, some people, uh, somebody's saying it didn't do much for them. So this is why we're going to do uh, different types of relaxation because this is not for everyone. Some people have a hard time just focusing on an image. So we'll do relaxation later where it's much more sort of active for relaxation. Um, but easier for people whose minds tend to wander. So thanks for that feedback. So what I wanna move into is I wanna move into psychological first care and talking about psychological survival of the pandemic. And so your overall orientation right now is gonna be about survival versus happiness. So we're gonna talk about how to treat your current self. Like I said, your goal in this is not happiness, uh, your goal is to get through this without developing a new mental health disorder or worsening and exacerbating one. So while it is important for you to do as much of what you can as makes you happy, um, it's not about happiness. It's about psychological self-protection and survival. And we call this resilience, meaning that you will suffer in this. We are all suffering. But if you take care of yourself, you will bounce back better uh, if you prioritize the following. The first thing I want us all to talk about is news diet. This is a huge one right now. So get your, get your pen and paper ready, everyone. I've got mine, I'm gonna be doing this with you. So about the media, especially cable news, the media is fully aware that our brains are built to fixate on threat, uncertainty, and negativity, and they capitalize on this. Most news sources are negatively biased, sensationalist, and speculative, in order to win your attention. Uh, anxiety is easily fueled by consuming, by consuming this kind of information. So to reduce anxiety, it's important to be aware of and take control over your information diet. 
an anecdote from my life. I was in my laundry room in my building a couple of months ago, double masked, of course, and I was doing laundry and MSNBC was on. And I don't have cable news, I don't have cable, we don't watch cable news. And I got sucked into this story and I got sucked in because the host was talking so urgently about something. And they had you know people in little boxes discussing, debating, and I, I put scare quotes because they weren't really debating. They're just yelling at each other and everything is urgent. There's words flying around and I got sucked into this and it really worked me up. And then I realized after two minutes that they were rehashing a story that I had read in the New York Times the day before, that I was completely hooked, but they were giving me zero new information. In fact, I knew more than they did on this thing from the story the day before. So you've got to be really, really careful. In fact, for that reason, I don't recommend anyone watch any cable news period for their mental well-being. And that's just a hard rule. People ask, I say, start there. And if you're not willing to do that, then I don't know what to tell you. So in the um, q and I want you to share ideas. Why, I want you to share some ideas of what are some good, trusted news sources. So I will read out what, we, what you say to me and, and definitely start writing down things that stand out to you as good. So what are some trusted news sources? Okay, I'm seeing the New York Times and The Economist. Okay, New York Times is a popular one. I highly endorse the New York Times, BBC, that's a great one. NPR, also very good. Um, lots of New York Times, lots of BBC. Oh, okay, how do you recommend we stay up on date while preserving our mental health? We're gonna get to that in a second about how we consume news. Uh, someone's putting up Reuters. Oh, Politico, that's a great one. Wall Street Journal, if you can afford it. I'm so cranky that Wall Street Journal has not made their COVID coverage free. Um, I like the, that the Atlantic has made their COVID coverage free to anyone. Someone just mentioned the Atlantic. I highly recommend the Atlantic uh, because their COVID coverage has been top notch. Krista, is, can you uh, can you verify that? Okay, Krista's not, she can verify that. Definitely. Okay, yeah, so Atlantic is, if you wanna get your COVID news from somewhere, get it from the Atlantic. Uh, Washington Post is also great. Um, yeah, we're kinda of getting a lot of the same stuff, Times, uh, BBC is more objective than the US ones, Wall Street Journal, NPR, Washington Post. Okay, right. So we're getting a lot of the same ones now. Thank you all for those wonderful um, suggestions. So I don't need any more suggestions on that. Thank you. Um, and oh, and somebody just mentioned that WashU gives free Wall Street Journal access to students. So take advantage of that. So uh, the next question that we have to think about is not only what um, what news sources we're going to consume, but how often are, oh, WashU, oh, oh, WashU also gives uh, free New York Times students to so take advantage of that. Wow, you guys are really lucky. You get like a discount to Headspace and free New York Times and uh, WashU, you guys are lucky. So uh, next, I want us to talk about how often we should be checking these news sources. So what do you guys think is a realistic and healthy way to stay informed while not driving yourself crazy with the news. How often do you think you should be checking these? When I hear twice a week, I hear once a day, once or twice a day, I hear once a day max from somebody, I like that. Um, once in the morning, every three-ish days, once a week, one time a day. Okay, most people are settling on between one to two times a day. One person says as much as you can handle it. That's fair, you know, be mindful of how are you actually doing perhaps twice a week. Three days. Okay, so um, we have all sorts of answers. So what I want you to do is take your pen and paper and write information diet on it. Because you're going to come out of this not only with some relaxation tools, but you're going to come out with a plan, some plans for how to manage yourself in all this. And I'm going to do this with you. And so after, under information diet, what I want you to do is I want you to list out the two to four news sources that you're going to, uh, to check and then how often and when you're gonna do it. So for me, and Krista, maybe you'll weigh in after this. For me, I'm gonna start with the Chicago Tribune. That's my local paper here. Actually, I'm gonna start with Facebook, but not the news stories. I'm gonna go to Facebook for the memories feature so that I can look at pictures of vacations, of meals, of time spent with friends and, fam and family. And then once I'm done with my memories of the day, I'm closing Facebook. 
then I'm doing the Tribune. Then I will do the Times. And then I'll do Atlantic. And for me, I will do those once a day in the morning. And then what I'm going to do is, for me, once, uh, once a day, midday, I'm going to check the Illinois Department of Public Health and the Chicago Department of Public Health because around 1 p.m. they release their latest stats. So I'm gonna check the Departments of Public Health to see what the state and municipal trends are for COVID. We're very lucky you're here in Chicago. The COVID rates are, the positivity rates are the lowest they've ever been since they're doing testing. They're getting to 3%. So that's gonna be, um, that's gonna be my information diet. And I've got no problem sticking to this. I've been doing it for months already. Krista, do you, what do you think you're gonna do? Yeah, so um, I, I, that Facebook memory thing is a great idea. I've just been trying to lay off of Facebook a lot. Other more. than that, no, 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 no yeah. Facebook other than that. It's rough, uh, but I do, I do look at Twitter a lot because I follow a lot of and scientists who post a lot of what they're working on on Twitter. Um, so I find things that way. I usually listen to like the five to 10 minute hourly update of NPR in the morning. Mm. And um, I have a subscription to the New Yorker. So once a week I read my New Yorker to get, and they, they had a, recently they had a huge spread on COVID kind of from start to where we are now. And then Johns Hopkins, I think their COVID tracker is good. That's a really good one too. And I bring up the piece about Facebook because one thing that I've learned is that when you're feeling really, really down, one of the best things that you can do is look at old vacation photos. And this was even true before the pandemic. If, if you're having a bad day, you know, go onto Facebook and find your album from that trip to Italy and look at that and almost guarantee you it'll pick up your spirits. So I was, yeah, I was looking for some pictures of certain types of monkeys over the weekend and I went back through some old uh, files and found like all of these old pictures of, you know, animals that I usually get to see a couple times a year. And oh. I know. Oh, but it, but it, how did how, how I make you feel? It was great. It was great. Yeah. I was like, I should look at these all the time. Yeah. So everyone go back and look at, at, at old photos of, of times when you got to go places and do things with people and things. Um, okay. So that is the, uh, that is the news diet. Let's see, where are we here? So other things that you can do to manage your anxiety and depression. One of the biggest ones is to make this time not feel lost is you can find meaning in this time. There can be post-traumatic stress uh, from times like this, but there can also be post-traumatic growth. So it's possible to have intensely negative reactions to what you're experiencing, but it's also, and you will experience despair and stress, uh, acknowledging um, you know, how bad things are but if you can find meaning and hope, it'll sustain you. There's a great book on this by a man named Viktor Frankl. It's called Man's Search for Meaning, where he writes about how he survived psychologically and physically uh, the Holocaust and being in a concentration camp by finding meaning. I know for me, the meaning that I find in a lot of the suffering and the, the sacrifice is contributing to a greater good, knowing that staying home is, that's the only control that I have over this. Uh, so keeping that in mind has really made me feel like, okay, my role in this has been a powerful one in that has been doing everything I can to stop the spread of this while we get this under control, particularly in this crucial window that we're in right now. So another one is to foster connections with others uh, as safely as you can. Like I said, we're social animals and we're only as happy as our relationships are nurturing and fulfilling. So finding all the ways that you can to connect. It's been easy to give up and stop connecting because we're all sick of Zoom calls. Uh, we don't wanna have another one on the weekend. But what I've been telling people is to do something really old fashioned and just pick up your phone and call someone. No warning, uh, no arranged thing. Just start calling people and see who picks up and see if they've got time to talk. We used to do this all the time. When I, when I was in college, you would just call someone and see if they were home. So little things like that, or if you're on social media like Instagram, use it to connect with people. What I've noticed is that people who are, are in entertainment who can't, uh, and this is just a funny anecdote on my part, 
who, um, who can't perform right now are so eager for attention that they'll talk to anyone. So I've connected with a lot of like theater performers that I don't know but admire very much because they're just willing to talk. And that's been such a, that's been such an infusion of energy. So there is, there are ways, if you find them, there are ways to get a lot of amazing new connection to people that you don't even know. Um, in fact, I was uh, reading a book by Edmund White, The Farewell Symphony, and I posted a picture of it. And someone I connected with was his husband and he commented, he's like, oh, this book is dedicated to me. And I was like, oh, cause I started reading it on Valentine's day. And it was, and, and so it was just somebody I'd met through all this COVID meeting of strange Instagram, his husband uh, saw that I posted his book that was dedicated to him. And it was a really sweet kind of moment. So you can still do things like that if you find them. Another thing you can do to help yourself right now is to help others. So it's a great way to get outside of your head and outside of your suffering and your boredom. You can donate money, you can donate time, you can ask yourself, what do people in your life need from you right now? Do they need a call in once in a while? Is somebody going through a hard time? Uh, you know, nothing, regular misery hasn't stopped on top of all of this. I have a few friends who, in addition to COVID, they have elderly parents that are dealing with cancer. So make sure to reach out to them and see if they need something from you. Also, your future self will judge you more kindly for doing more for other people in this period. So another one is to seek out novelty as safely as you can, however you can. Like I said, our most basic urge is to find new things. A long time ago, that was food and security. Now that's things like information, books, the arts, sports. And we all need something to focus on. In a way, you're lucky because you're students. So you have schoolwork to focus on. Um, something to focus on working your way through progressively is extremely psychologically healthy right now. So use that in that way and find new things however you can. So the last thing I wanna say uh, about what will get you through this period is approaching everything with a flexible mindset. This is perhaps the most crucial thing you can do at this moment in time. Like I said, the light is at the end of the tunnel and people are starting to plan and they're getting very excited about their plans. They're even setting dates for things, which is really not possible for us to do. Uh, remember the virus is in control, not us. So if you do make a plan, whenever you make a plan, uh, have it in the front of your mind that this may have to change, maybe even at last minute. If you get stuck in a rigid mindset about the future, you're setting yourself up for a lot of heartbreak when things inevitably change. Whereas if you have a flexible mindset, you're setting yourself up uh, for resiliency in the face of inevitable change. So I wanna really emphasize that. So finally, if you find that you're suffering too much, there is always treatment. WashU has a health center that you can contact for help. If they're overwhelmed, they can help you find providers. Um, so treatment can help. And this is where I'm gonna give a nod to the fact that this is um, affecting marginalized populations far more than the dominant population. Getting treatment, getting good treatment is much harder for them. And, and of course, that's a been a theme of every part of this, but just make a nod and a mention because I can't not mention the treatments there, but it's, uh, it's not as easily accessible to marginalized populations. So I wanna move on to a, another, um, another relaxation uh, protocol. And what I wanna talk about is breathing. So breathing difficulties are associated with anxiety and stress. When you have problems with your breathing, you lower the amount of carbon dioxide that's normally circulating in your blood. And this can lead to a wide range of symptoms, including uh, shortness of breath, chest tightness, tingling or numbness in the limbs, fingers, or around the mouth, uh, being dizzy or lightheaded, weakness, heart racing, heart palpitations, sweating or hot flushes, headaches, nausea, or even fatigue. So some of these symptoms as you're listening can make you think you have COVID, which of course is gonna make you very, very anxious. So these symptoms can appear out of the blue 
and can also lead to panic attacks. So if you have breathing difficulties, they may be related to one of two things. One, either shallow breathing, where you breathe in too quickly and not deeply enough, or two, over breathing, where you breathe in more air as you feel like you're not getting enough for example, through yawning or sighing frequently, some people experience both. So what I'm gonna do with you right now is take a moment to test your breathing. So everyone put one hand on their chest and one hand on your belly right below your rib cage. Um, and so just breathe in for a few seconds and just, uh, just breathe like normal. And ask yourself, as you're breathing, uh, which of your hand rises? Is it the hand on your chest or the hand on your belly? If the hand on your chest is rising, if it's rising like when you're breathing in, you might have developed a habit of shallow breathing. The ideal breath is one where as you breathe in, your belly expands outward slightly. And as you breathe out, your belly uh, collapses in slightly. It's called diaphragmatic breathing because that's where your diaphragm is located. And this is the kind of breathing that makes sure that you're getting just the right amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide in your blood. And this is the kind of breathing that if you do it can also lower your auto stress in your body and bring on a sense of relaxation. So um, although the effects of shallow breathing can be unpleasant, it won't harm you and you can reverse the habit with a daily breathing practice. So the next time you feel anxious, take a moment to notice your breathing. Notice is it your chest, is it your stomach and focus on breathing through your stomach so that your belly rises when you inhale and drops when you exhale. So here is a belly breathing exercise that you can practice for five to 10 minutes a day. I, it says, I say five to 10 minutes, and I would say skimping less than five minutes per day is much less effective. Uh, it really takes several minutes for your um, sympathetic nervous system and your anxiety to disengage uh, and to really activate that parasympathetic nervous system. So what we're gonna do is, look, I'm gonna have you close your eyes and get relaxed, and then you're gonna inhale gently through your nose, lightly and slowly, and count to four while you do it, expanding your belly as you do so. I'm gonna have you hold for two and then exhale through your mouth for a count of six and then hold for two. Two things on this. We are um, having you exhale for longer than you breathe in because more carbon dioxide in your blood means more relaxed. So we actually wanna get more oxygen out of your blood. And then also, my favorite part about this whole thing is the holding for two after you exhale because um, your body's at peace for a second. It doesn't need anything. I call that moment eternity. I love it. So um, this is called belly breathing and research shows that practicing regularly belly breathing can help people uh, feel calmer chronically within a matter of weeks. So um, once again, I'm gonna turn my camera off so you can close your eyes and focus on yourself. And I'm gonna set a timer and we're gonna do three minutes of it now. So what I'm gonna do is I'll get you started with a few rounds of counting, uh, maybe three or four rounds of, of, of counting the breaths so you get the pace of it. And then I'm just gonna go quiet and give you a few minutes to practice in silence. And I'll let you know uh, when the time is up. Okay, so everyone, I'm turning my camera off. Everyone close your eyes, get comfortable. Just take a regular breath. And when you're ready, start inhaling gently through your nose to a count of four. Inhale, two, three, four, hold, two. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, hold, two. Inhale. Hold, exhale, two, three, four, five, six, hold, inhale, hold, exhale, 
構、長野青い All right, that's been three minutes. So start to wake up, open your eyes, um, move around. And in the Q and A, uh, let me know. Uh, let me know how that was for you. What, what, what experiences you had with that? Okay. Someone said amazing, made my stomach feel better. Oh, felt calm on this one. Oh, felt restorative. Oh, feel more alert. That's great. Oh, wow. you guys are really, really enjoyed that. Uh, hard not to let my, my mind wander. We'll get to that one later. Um, some people found this easier to calm your mind than trying to imagine the candle. And refreshing, relaxed. At first I got a little lightheaded, but began feeling more relaxed. That's not unusual. Uh, to feel a little lightheaded at first, don't let that spook you because you're doing something new with your breathing and you're regulating it. And so your body may take a second to catch up and figure out what it's doing with its oxygen. So thanks for mentioning you got lightheaded. Don't let that spook you. Um, a bit difficult not to feel impatient. Uh, I feel you on that one these days about anything, right? Um, someone said they started counting slower and it felt even better. Mess around with it. Um, Nearly fell asleep. All right, I like to hear that one. Uh, easy to get distracted. Okay, so it seems like general, uh, general overall, people found it very relaxing. Sometimes hard to get um, uh, your mind to stop from wandering, 
that's to be expected. Some people have more active minds uh, in terms of imagination and wandering uh, than other people, but it sounds like most of you found that great. So if you can do that every single day for five to 10 minutes, you'll not only feel better every single day, you're gonna be more psychologically resilient uh, on a day-to-day -day basis to the crises that come at you than if you don't do this. I highly, highly recommend it. And also if you find that you're having a panic attack, this is the first thing that you need to do. If you, if you can do this, it takes, like I said, it takes three minutes to turn your sympathetic, sympathetic nervous system off, but if you're having a panic attack, you can sit down and do this. You can greatly reduce the length of the panic attack. So, okay. Can I ask you a clarifying question? From Certainly, what is that? Uh, when you are <laughs> inhaling, does it need to be through your nose? It does not need to be through your nose, but um, it's hard for me to demonstrate. Maybe you can hear this. There's a certain kind of breathing that you can only do through your nose. So those of you who do yoga, um, sometimes they talk about making a breath that sounds like the ocean. Like it might sound like, can you hear that when I did that? And so that's a kind of breathing that only happens when your mouth is closed and you're breathing through your nose where you feel the air really circulating in the back and it makes a like a whooshing noise. And you don't have to make that noise, but if you are making that noise, you are guaranteed that you are breathing correctly. So it doesn't have to be through your nose, but um, the best kind of breathing does happen through your nose. Thanks for asking. And also, um, we also know that as you breathe in, your heart rate accelerates, and as you exhale, your heart rate decelerates. So also don't be a little spooked if when you first start breathing in, you feel like your heart rate might goes up a little bit. That's, that's normal and that might feel like a little lightheaded as well, but don't worry about that. Okay, so moving on, the next thing we're gonna talk about is um, focusing on what you can control versus what you cannot. I think that might be the thing that I say most to people when they are spiraling and anxious. I'm like, what can you control here? What can you not control? So if you're prone to hypothetical worry, which is the sort of what if thoughts, uh, you may find it helpful to practice noticing these thoughts and then redirecting your attention to things which you can control. Research shows that when we shift our focus to what we can control, we see meaningful and lasting differences in our well-being, health, and performance. So together, let's take a minute to think about first what you have control over. So get your, get your pad again, this is gonna be part of your plan. I want you to write two columns side by side. The first one on the left is what you can control. And then one on the left, I mean the right, for what you can't control. So I wanna have a discussion. Let's hit the Q and A again. Um, and let's talk about first, what are the things that you do have control over right now? in your lives. So go and I'll, I'll tell people, I'll say what people are saying. Just taking a second, oh, here we go. How much you sleep, that's really good. How much you react to a situation, how much time you spend on school, diet, yes, diet and exercise, you can control that. This is, these are all things that are part of resiliency, control how you react to others, you can control, and, and if you hear things that really stand out to you, make sure to write them down in your in best part of your plan. Uh, you can control health in terms of exercising and eating properly. Somebody wrote you can control your emotions. I would, I would say that you can't control your emotions, but you can control what you do with them. So don't feel pressure to control your emotions. That's impossible, but you, you, you are that you can control what, how you respond to them. Um, control your own actions. Exactly, you can control what you do uh, on any given day. You can control getting outside. That's true. Get, make a point to get outside that is absolutely in, in your control. Um, mentality and actions. You can control your schedule. That's a really good idea. Having a schedule in all of this is really, really, is really, really effective. Everyone says so, and everyone, of course, at some point gets off their schedule, but getting back on it is the best thing. Um, let's see how I spend my time. Those are all good. Something people haven't said before. 
Oh, I can control my coffee in the morning. I like that one. We do not need extra coffee these days. We don't need extra cigarettes or coffee uh, during a stressful period. Um, how often you call your loved ones. Uh, this is great. And I would you know, add to things like that, um, things like we're doing, like this relaxation. You can control how much you relax. Uh, you can control um, seeking connection and offering support. I would also say you can control how you engage in politics. You can control how you vote and your activism. I'd, I'd add those. Um, yeah, and some people are talking about classes and clubs. Oh, and someone says their intentions. I really, really like that one. That one's really good. Um, okay, so these are great. So we have a list of things that we can control. Now I wanna switch to the things that we cannot control. So what are things that we do not have control over right now and should not focus on as much? Oh, the future? So we have no control over that. Everyone is saying other people's actions. That's a really good one. You can't control what other people are gonna do. Uh, you can't control the weather. That's a really good one. Um, oh, you can't control the virus, right? Um, oh, this is going, you can't control what other people think of you. You can't control the overall course of the pandemic. You can't control other people going out and partying. You can't control vaccine distribution. That's a really good one. That one is just out of our control right now for the time being. Um, what else? What is, you can't control what's posted on social media. So be really careful about visiting it in the first place. You can't, you can't control your emotions. Uh, you can't control things that you already done. That keeps coming up a lot. You can control what you're doing now, but you can't control what you already did. Right, you can't control when we're gonna reach normality again. Um, and hope you're writing down things that stand out to you. Let's see if we're getting any new ones or not. Can't control the news, can't control, oh, can't control politics. That's a really good one. Um, I like that one a lot. I'd also say you can't control um, events like weddings, whether they're gonna happen. You can't control school openings or closings. You can't control the quality of state, the quality of the state of the healthcare system. Um, you can't uh, control um, the government's actions either. It's things that I, you know, when you say about like the news and what's happening in the outside world, or so, you know, so things that you just don't have any control over. Um, so again, in the Q and A, let's keep talking. Tell me how did that make you feel to list out? How did that make you feel to list out things that you can control and things you cannot control? What did that do for you? Someone said it felt freeing. Oh, and someone said it reminds them that they actually do have things that they have control over and should be focusing on during this time. I really like that. It's something so that ironically, I felt more in control than before. Well, that's great to hear. More in control than I feel typically. Oh, and yeah, people saying it tells them what to focus their energy on. This is all wonderful. I'm so glad that you guys are having this experience. It's exactly what I was hoping was gonna happen. Oh, and somebody said, you know, they realize that there actually are way more things that we can control than that we can't. And so that's a really beautiful one. So we'll pause on that one. Those are all great. I'm so glad that you guys had that experience. Um, and uh, with that, we're going to move on to our final activity. This one is called progressive muscle relaxation. And so uh, once again, I'm going to, okay, so for this one, you know, get comfortable in your chair as much as you can. Get some space around you if you can. You're gonna be moving around just a little bit. Uh, you're gonna be looking weird while you do this. So hopefully you're alone, but if you're in public or people are in the room with you, either say you don't care and do it anyways, or imagine that you're doing it if you can't do it and then come back and actually do it later. Um, so once again, I'm going to um, turn my camera off and so you don't have any distractions and uh, get comfortable. 
and we'll start. Progressive muscle relaxation. In order to help you relax, we're going to teach you how to tell the difference between a tense muscle and the relaxed muscle. We're going to do this by going through the body and tensing different muscles, then relaxing them so that you can feel the difference. Now get into a comfortable position in your chair and have a little room around you to move a bit. Let's start with some cleansing breaths in and out, in and out, letting the tension fade away. Keep breathing in and out. And with the next out breath, allow your eyes to gently close. We're going to start with the legs. Raise both your legs off the ground and point your toes forward. Point them hard, really straining and stressing the muscles on the top of your legs. Study the tension and what it feels like. Now let your legs drop to the floor and completely relax. And study the difference between the relaxed feeling you have now versus the tense feeling you had a moment ago. It feels much better, much more relaxed. Once again, lift your legs up and point your toes forward. Point them hard and feel the knotty, uncomfortable sensation in your muscles as you do so. Now, once again, drop your legs and let them completely relax. You feel much better than you did a moment ago with the tension in your legs. Enjoy this feeling. Now, lift your legs and push both heels forward. Push them as far forward as you can, feeling the straining on the bottom of your legs, how those muscles have to strain to push those heels forward. And study that straining feeling. Now, let the legs drop and completely relax. You feel much better. You might even feel a sensation of warmth flowing into the muscles as you allow them to completely relax. Once again, raise your legs and push both heels forward. Push them hard to make the muscles strain. Study that strained feeling. Now, let your legs drop and relax once again. Feel the difference between when they were uncomfortable a moment ago and how relaxed they are now. Feel your legs. Your legs feel completely relaxed. Moving to your arms, bend both hands back at the wrists. Bend them hard to really feel the tops of your forearms really strain. Study that tension. Then let your hands drop forward and let the muscles in your arm completely relax. Notice the difference between the tension a moment ago and how you feel now. Once again, bend both hands back at the wrists and really, really strain to hold your hands up. You feel uncomfortable, tense, now let your hands drop and just fall comfortably in your lap. Feel much more relaxed than you did a moment ago. Enjoy this feeling. Now with your arms or with your hands, once again, make fists with both hands. Really squeeze your hands tight into fists and feel the muscles on the bottom of your arm tensing up and feel the muscles in your hands and your fingers tensing up. Squeeze harder and then relax and let your hands fall into your lap. This feels so much better than it did a moment ago. Let the muscles continue to relax and relax. Once again, make your hands into fists. Squeeze them very tightly 
Get as much tension in there as you can and feel what it's like to be tense. Now let your hands fall into your lap, relaxed, let the tension flow out. You may even feel a sense of warmth coming over them. Your limbs are completely relaxed. As we're going through this, if you find that your attention is wandering, just bring it back to this. If your mind wanders a thousand times, bring it back a thousand times. Now, lift your legs off the ground and use your stomach muscles to hold them in the air. Feel the muscles in your stomach straining to keep your legs. Feel how tense they have to be to do that. Now drop your legs and let your stomach muscles go limp. And let them go loose and appreciate this feeling. It's way better than with the tension. Once again, lift your legs off the ground, using your stomach muscles to support them. Hold your legs up and really focus on just how tense that makes your stomach feel and how unpleasant this feeling is. Now, let your legs drop back to the ground and feel how relaxed your stomach is. And really notice what a difference it is to have a tense stomach versus a relaxed stomach and how much better this feels. Now we'll move to your back. Arch your back away from the chair. Arch it hard. You should really feel the tension in the middle of your back as you strain to push your back away from the chair. Now relax and let your back uh, sink back into the chair and let the tension drain away. Your back feels much better than it did a moment ago. Once again, arch your back away from the chair, arch it hard, really get it tense so you know what a tense back feels like. This is what tension feels like. And then relax. Let your back muscles relax. Enjoy how good this feels, how much better this feels than a tense back. Now we'll move to your shoulders. Raise your shoulders, arch them high so they're practically in your ears. Really squeeze them. Feel the tension in your shoulders. Feel how uncomfortable this is. And then let them drop. Let them drop completely and completely relax. Maybe they're lower than they were before even. And enjoy this relaxed feeling. Now raise your shoulders once again, raise them high. Really study what it's like to have tense shoulders, just how unpleasant it is. Feel that and then let them drop again and let the relaxation flow into them. This feels so much better than it did before. Now, take a deep breath. Take a deep, deep breath, forcing the air in, feeling the tightness in your chest now exhale and feel the air flow out and your chest relax and the warm sensation flow in. Take another deep breath, really breathing in, forcing as much air as you can in there, super uncomfortable and let it all out. And feel how much better, how much warmer, how much more relaxed you feel inside than when you were breathing in uh, too much. Enjoy this feeling. Your body's completely relaxed. Now, pull down on the corners of your mouth, like you're frowning, and clench your teeth together real hard. Use your muscles to pull down on the corners of your mouth in a hard frown. Clench your teeth together and really feel the tension in your mouth and your teeth. Now let it go and feel how your jaw and your mouth are relaxed. Your mouth might be even slightly open in this relaxed position. So once again, use your muscles to pull down to the corners of your mouth in a deep frown and clench your teeth together. Really clench them and pull down. And then 
relax and let your cheeks go loose. Your jaw might be slightly open in this relaxed position. This is a relaxed position for your jaw. Now, close your mouth and push your tongue against the back of your teeth as hard as you can. Really push against the back of your teeth and feel the tension that causes all up and down your throat. Study that tension, it's very unpleasant. Now, completely relax your mouth and let your mouth go limp. Your throat feels much better than it did a moment ago and much more relaxed. This is way better than the tension. Once again, close your mouth and push your tongue against the back of your teeth, really tensing up the muscles deep in your throat. Feel the knotty, uncomfortable feeling in this. And then relax and let your mouth go limp again. Your mouth, your throat, and your cheeks feel much better this way, much more relaxed, much less tension. Now squint your eyes. Squint your eyes really hard. Really make the eyes tense and squint and study the tension. Now let your eyes relax. Either they may be closed or they may be slightly open, not focusing on anything. This is a relaxed position for your eyes. Your eyes feel so much better than when you were squinting. Now, once again, squint your eyes really hard. Squint down, really get the muscles in your cheeks and your eyes and your forehead tense. Now let go and let your eyes fall into their relaxed position. This feels so much better. Now furrow your brows together in a frown. Frown hard with your brows uh, and really, really feel the tension in the bottom of your forehead and on your brows and above your eyes and behind your eyes. Now let them relax and let your eyes fall into a relaxed position, slightly open, gently closed and feel how much better it is without the frowning. Frown once again Frown hard, really, really frown. Really get those muscles tense so you know what a tense face feels like. It's not good. Now relax your face and feel what a, feel what a relaxed face feels like. Finally, raise your brows, arch them as high as you possibly can and make your forehead as tense as you can. Really feel what it's like to have a tense forehead and tense eyebrows. Now relax them and let your face and your mouth and your eyes all go limp and enjoy that feeling. Once again, raise your brows, arch them high, get your forehead real tense. Now let them drop and feel how relaxed and smooth your forehead is now. Notice the relaxation in your face and in your throat. Your back and your shoulders are relaxed. Your limbs are relaxed. You are now completely relaxed. Enjoy this feeling for a few moments. All right, now start opening your eyes and getting back into uh, reality. So in the Q&A, uh, tell, uh, tell me how that made you feel, what that experience is like for you. Okay, so someone said, uh, this was the least favorite one because they felt the tensing was hard and relaxing. So it doesn't feel great. Somebody else said that they liked that this felt more like a more active form of relaxation. This is actually my preferred form of relaxation because I'm very prone to my mind wandering to very anxious thoughts. And so the fact that you have to constantly focus on your body and you're moving around helps me relax a lot more than just sitting through guided imagery. So um, someone said it was too long, but it was okay at first. It is long. 
it is true. But if you make it shorter, you lose out on the relaxation. The whole point is you go offline for 10 to 15 minutes. That's really important. Um, some people saying that they felt the stress out of their body. This is more relaxing. Again, some people saying this was the hardest one for them. And so this is why, um, oh, when people are talking about which ones worked best for them, like the hand clenching one worked best. Somebody said the stomach one was best. Somebody said, oh my, I didn't realize how tight my jaw was. I know for me, when I do this, when I first started doing this, I didn't realize that I basically walk around with my shoulders in my ears all the time as it is, if I'm not checking it. Um, and uh, so yeah, people are saying uh, this was better. It wasn't as good. Um, and so basically the takeaway is that you have to find the kind of relaxation that's right for you. So we did three very different types of relaxation. So you can find the one that works for you. Like I said, this is the best one for me. It's not the best one for everyone. Um, so, and you'll have all three of them here on YouTube for you, whichever one you prefer, you can find here and you can go and find more, uh, later as well. So I'm going to move on to the final thing that I want to leave you with, and maybe we'll have time for questions. So this whole time we've been talking about how to take care of your present self. How do you manage your present suffering and everything you're going through, the, the isolation, the anxiety, the sadness. My fi the final part of my presentation is I want to talk about how do you care for your future self, the self that has not yet happened, has not yet, is not. Um, and I've been hearing people talk about balancing mental health versus exposure to COVID and precautions. Like if I'm suffering mentally, but I'm young and not too likely to get sick, should I lower my precautions so that I'm suffering less mentally? So, uh, and it's true that college age students or college age individuals are suffering so much mentally because of all these milestones that are getting messed up and because also just neurologically their frustration tolerance and risk aversion has not come online yet. That won't happen until you're about 24. So people, people have asked, is there an imperative to let younger people relax precautions to protect their mental health? Um, my first thoughts are, I completely get it. This is awful. And I can easily, easily imagine put myself in your shoes, how it would feel to have lost out on a year and a half to two years of undergraduate or graduate experiences. They're so formative. And unfortunately, because of the way things ran, this is your experience. Uh, I'm really, really sorry. Uh, it didn't have to be this way. It shouldn't have been this way. I don't know what to tell you. I'm sorry. Um, my other thought is, I'm not sure that letting down precautions is actually going to make anyone mentally healthier right now. Um, and here's why. You know, I know from kind of half auditing this class last semester and this semester, I know that um, every foregone precaution is a risk for a new infection. And I know that every infection it can be a new mutation. And I know that each mutation could be the one that is resistant to a vaccine, resistant to people who have had COVID, like people in Brazil who are getting COVID again because of a new strain, uh, could be more contagious and even worse, it could be more virulent. So with all that in mind, um, and this is about your mental health, let's you know, stay with me. With all that in mind, we have to talk about not just caring for your current frame of mind, which we just have, but we have to talk about something just as important a part of your psyche that you're not in yet, your future self. So there's a part of our psyche, Freud originally called it the superego. People today might simply call it your conscious, but this is an incredibly part of your powerful part of your psyche that either rewards you or punishes you based on what you've done. It's incredibly powerful. So it can shower you with praise, um, but it can also tear you down. Example, if you do good things, it makes you feel good. This part of your brain tells you you're good. And we know that if you uh, engage in a little bit of retail therapy, that feels good. You feel good for a couple hours or a couple of days. But we know if you spend that exact same amount of money donating it to a good cause or donating your time uh, to a good cause, you, that part of your brain showers you with praise for days or weeks. So this is really, really powerful stuff. So it can really build you up. However, if you do things you regret, this same part of your brain can punish you very terribly for a long time and affect your future mental health. 
So when you make any decision, you must consider how your actions might make uh, your future self feel about you. So you have to ask yourself, how is what's in front of me going to affect me? Um, but how might it affect other people? I'm thinking of that very infamous wedding in Maine, where uh, I think maybe 50 or so people gathered indoors without precautions. And I'm sure they all said, I've, I've assessed the risks for me and I'm willing to take it. However, the people they came into contact with afterwards did not consent to those risks. And people from that wedding took the virus and people 200 miles away in nursing homes and prisons died. So no one who went to that wedding died. Everyone who died did not attend the wedding. They were prisoners. They were nursing home uh, residents. So you have to think about how this can affect people around you, your family. You have to think about the medical workers who um, are uh, completely burnt out, are, are despairing, are quitting the field left and right in the middle of pandemic because they can't take it anymore. So what I say to yourself is, what you need to do is ask yourself, to, to protect your future self and your happiness, you need to ask yourself, um, how might your future self judge your actions and their possible consequences? And what story do you want to be able to look back and tell about yourself when you look back at this period in time? And what is a story of yourself and your actions that you can be proud of? So I'll leave it at that. I love that message. I mean, I think, yeah, you know, exactly as you said, we need to look out for our mental health, not just now, but in the future. And I think something that you said at the beginning of this session um, relates to that also, which is looking for new experiences. And the reality is that we often fall back on these easy things that we know make us happy, right? Like going to a party or doing all the things that we normally do. But this is actually a great opportunity, just like you showed us today, um, to try and learn, have some new experiences and learn new things, safe ways that we can still protect our mental health. Because these, it is not one or the other. It is possible to care for your mental health and to also practice safety precautions. Um, and I think it's a great challenge to, to try and do that. I also really appreciate that you, what you said to the students about the fact that it is very sad that they are in, in university right now during this particular time and how much they've lost because of that. I know you feel very strongly about that and many of us do, um, that we are sorry that you're experiencing this. It's a really, it's a bad time um, to, to be a university student right now and obviously. Yeah, you're missing out on a lot because of that. So we are sorry about that. There are even more questions beyond what we sent you in advance of this. Um, maybe I'll just try and get through a couple really quickly, some terrifying questions. Um, and, and, you know, like you said, I think different students really enjoyed the one, of, one or the other activities more. Um, so some of them were wondering, for example, is the candle visual, vis, visualization, oof, I can't talk today, uh, is the, the idea of the candle, is that um, the, the go-to kind of guided imagery uh, image or are there different ones? Oh no, not by a long stretch. There are countless guided imagery and sometimes you don't need to do guided imagery. Sometimes you can just do imagery on your own. One thing that we recommend when people have trouble sleeping is that they imagine that they are somewhere safe and comfortable and they imagine it as vividly as possible. And so you can choose whatever you want and you can be doing whatever you want with whoever you want, wherever you want. And the whole point is um, to just be focusing your mind as vividly as you can so that you can get your mind distracted and not worrying and then your body can take you to sleep while your mind is thinking about a forest or a waterfall or a comfortable bed or something. So no, there's millions out there. You can find whatever you want, or you can literally just make up your own. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you two more questions. Okay. Go. How often should they be trying to do these different exercises? Right now, once a day, at least. Okay. Um, the more you do them, the more powerful they get because you build up an association to them. So, you know, after you do them, you're relaxed. And the more you do it, the more you know when you start. It's like, okay, I know I'm going to feel, and your body will start to get relaxed sooner. And then the more you do it, the more powerful it gets. So 
for at least two to four weeks, I'd say choose one and do it at least once a day and then see how often you need it afterwards. Because I said like building, build, building up the association is, is, is key. Okay, great. One last question. Um, so some students may be apprehensive about doing these activities because they are concerned about being alone with their thoughts. Do you have any advice for them about how to tackle that? Oh, that's a really good one. If you're concerned, and, and, and that's, this is actually also why I didn't do a mindfulness ex exercise because mindfulness is all about being alone with your thoughts and mindfulness is inherently not necessarily relaxing. That's why I did not do mindfulness today. That was, that was a very purposeful choice. Um, if you have a hard time being alone with your thoughts, I'd say give it a shot. If it's too much, just stop. Um, and if you find that you're having a hard enough, too much, too hard of a time being alone with your thoughts to do something like progressive muscle relaxation, I would do a couple things. Find other things that can relax you. Maybe it's a physical activity, like maybe it's going running, um, maybe it's exercising. And if that doesn't work, I would definitely recommend seeking professional help. That's great advice. Thank you. We are unfortunately out of time, but this has been wonderful. The students were saying this has been their favorite class so far. They oh, well, thank you. Yes. So thank you very much. Always happy to be here. I love your students. They're fantastic. And by, have me anytime, please. And then uh, thank you for much. Thank you for uh, goodbye. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yes, they are wonderful. Um, they are. So we are, we are in a wellness week now after today, so we will not be meeting on Wednesday, but until we see you again, stay safe. Bye everyone, stay safe.